Welcome to the first breakout session of ASH 2020. We're excited to have you join us virtually for four days of learning and connecting. Over the next few hours, you can choose from more than 40 presentations, including presidential and invited sessions. You can engage through the chat for most sessions and for some interactive symposia, you engage through large and small groups on screen. We're excited to join you at the ASH 2020 conference virtually. While this year looks different than previous ASH conferences, we are confident that we will all be able to engage and learn with colleagues. Enjoy the session. Well, I think I'm Should not Should we here. go ahead and get started? Yes, let's do it. All right, all right. Um, well, uh, I'll start us off. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Tom Nelson Laird, and I am uh, one of the editors of the Review of Higher Education, and I'm joined today by Ooh. Penny Pasquay. Say hi, Penny. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, and the editorial team is also here, and uh, we'll have a chance for folks to introduce themselves in a moment, so we'll let that happen. Um, Today we're talking about um, the publishing process and, and really trying to give people a behind the scenes look at what happens with publishing so that people understand uh, the process a little bit better and can get questions answered if you have them uh, about that. And we're, we're all involved in the Review of Higher Education, which is the journal of the Association of the Study of Higher Education, the official journal. And um, we'll be using the review uh, as our primary example, but uh, the editorial team is uh, uh, understands the process for a lot of other other places. We've been involved in other journals and other things. So if you have questions, not just about the review, but about other other things, we can help answer those as well. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. I think. Um, so we're going to we've done the welcome. We're going to do some introductions. We're going to talk a little bit about the review. Um, as an example, kind of what the review is and maybe how it's similar and different from other things. Um, we're going to walk through the publishing process and the timeline for the review. And again, how that's similar and different from other folks. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about book reviews for the review and what that's uh, currently looking like. We'll do some tips for submission and tips for uh, reviewers. And then we'll move into breakout rooms where you can get questions answered. Um, and we will, from the breakout rooms, end the session. So uh, that's our basic agenda. And I am going to turn it over to the managing editors to do uh, our land acknowledgments. Hi, everyone. RHC would like to acknowledge the indigenous homelands in which our editors are located. Ohio State University is located on the original ancestral homelands of the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, and Delaware Nation, and we support their continuing presence and sovereignty of their land. Jess? Yeah, um, and as such, Tom and I are, are located at Indiana University, and so we wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We acknowledge the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. All right, thank you. And we encourage everybody to um, engage in understanding the lands that they are on um, and their histories and um, the roots and the people who um, consider themselves the caretakers of, the, of those lands. All right. Let us introduce the editorial team. Um, name, pronouns, position, institution, and if you can share one insight you've learned um, being affiliated with RHE about the publishing process, that would be great. Um, why don't we start with uh, um, the editor, well, the associate editors. <laughs> um, who wants to go first? Well, Tom, did you want to oh, share at I, least should the I first four? Oh, and okay, I can, yes. <laughs> it's I'm, the first four. We can let them right. answer. Yes, uh, yeah. so I'm Tom Nelson Laird. He, him, his. Uh, I am a professor at Indiana University in the Higher Education Student Affairs Program and um, the editor of the review. And Penny, I'll turn it over to you then. 
Thank you. I am also an editor for the Review of Higher Education. My name is Penny Pasque, and my pronouns, my chosen pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm at The Ohio State University. And uh, Tom and I have both served as editors starting about this time last year. It's been about a year and uh, four or five months. So uh, we're, we'll turn it over to one of the associate editors. I'll say just whoever wants to go, we don't have to call on people today. I can go. Hi folks, I'm Heather Owen Kenyon. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm at Boston College and I'm one of the associate editors. And one of the things um, I've learned about the journal is that the reviewers take an immense amount of time to be able to provide strong feedback for your work to be able to improve over time. And um, I think they do a great job of it. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'll go next. Um, my name is Leslie Gonzalez. She, her, hers. I'm one of the associate editors. It's such a pleasure to serve in this uh, position. I'm um, at Michigan State University. It's situated on the ancestral contemporary um, homelands of the Anishinaabeg peoples. Um, <laughs> One of, the one of the insights that I've gained since serving as associate editor uh, for Review of Higher Ed is there is just so much good work in our field that is currently being done. And no matter how hard we work <laughs> or, or try to squeeze as much in, there's just so much space. So inevitably, there's some really great quality work that we just, it's just not going to make the pages. Um, so that is something that I just want to say that there's just so much good work happening. One of the things that we try to do is make sure that we find a space for it somewhere and suggest art, uh, journals that are other suitable places um, for authors to consider. Hey, hello everyone. I'm Eddie Cole, pronouns he, him, his. I am an associate professor of higher education at UCLA. And I'm also an associate editor for RHE as well as the book review editor. So you hear from me a little bit later about book reviews. Uh, but I also just want to say, say that one particular insight um, that I've learned being an associate editor um, is just the, the detailed timeline behind the scenes to move a manuscript through the process and gather that feedback. I have a much deeper appreciation through this role that I have right now for uh, just how many decisions and how many steps a manuscript has to go through before you get your decision as an author. Um, and I think that uh, has taught me a different level of patience and understanding uh, with my colleagues in the field that I did not have um, initially. So thank you for being here. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Malagrasan. Okay. Hi. Hi. Okay. Sorry, it just took me a minute to unmute myself. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Buenas tardes. I'm Milagros Castillo Montoya, and I go by she, her, her and ella pronouns. I am an assistant professor in um, the Department of Educational Leadership at the University of Connecticut. So I'm probably one of the newer um, associate editors and I have learned so much already. One of the things that I have learned that I don't think was as apparent to me before is that the editorial team really, really cares to give good quality feedback, whether or not you're going to end up publishing in this journal. Um, they really have an invested commitment um, to, to advance everyone's work. And so I don't think that, that was something I, I clearly um, gathered before, but now I feel excited about. And I hope that when you receive our feedback, you'll receive it with knowing that there's a lot of love being poured into that feedback for you. Thank you so much. Heather, you were going to introduce Angela, who couldn't be here today. Yes, right. so Dr. Angela Boatman uh, can't be here today. She is with another associate editor. She's with me here at Boston College. She's actually presenting an ASH paper in another session at the right. moment. But her um, insight is that the, the pairing process that we go through for reviewers and papers. When a paper comes in, the associate editors and associate editors look closely at them and think who would be a good match to be able to provide feedback for you, both in content area and methods. So that's, and the, the time that it takes to be able to do that and do it well is one of her insights she wanted to share. Great. And I know you heard from our two associate editor or managing editors, but I would love for the managing editors who have worked so hard to be able to introduce themselves as well, 
Hi everyone, I'm Victoria Barboza Olivo. I am a student at Ohio State University, Chi Her Hers. Um, and I've learned that faculty is not all about being by yourself. It's a lot of teamwork, which surprised me. I thought y'all were all alone and just kind of doing your own thing. So it's been nice. <laughs> And then, hello everyone, my name is Jess Esch. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am an EDD candidate at Indiana University and also the managing editor, well, the other managing editor um, here with the review. I actually, today, I realize I'm celebrating my one year anniversary with uh, the review of higher ed. So mm. exciting things. Um, and over the last year, there's so many things that they have mentioned that I think I learned, but um, more so than anything, I think just seeing the the breadth of scholarship that is submitted to our journal is really just astounding to me. Um, I didn't have nearly as much of a concept of the different things that people are researching or writing about, um, but I get the privilege in being in this role to be able to see um, all of those different work um, and from various levels. And so that's probably the coolest thing that I've learned. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right, that's, uh, that's our editorial team and some of their insights. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Penny to talk a little bit about the review of higher ed. And Thank you. We, I, I appreciated hearing the comments because we absolutely do care. I think we take up more of a team approach to the review. Uh, we are one of the leading journals in the field, and you'll see that in our figures in terms of our acceptance rates, which it does. It makes it really tough to... Uh, to work on the review process. And our approach is really to help whether or not you're in our pages, we wanna make sure that the feedback is solid and strong. And even if it's not in our journal, that hopefully it's useful feedback that you can take to another journal and get it published somewhere. Uh, and of course, we always love to send acceptance letters. It's all, that's our goal rather than the opposite. So um, we are the main journal for the association and we follow the bylaws, which means things like there are editorial board, people serve for a three-year term and then rotate off. And so we are now in compliance. Once Tom and I came on, I think people weren't uh, quite up on all the bylaws. And so we're making sure to be up on the bylaws. And what that means is we have an opportunity to bring in new people on the editorial board, have people serve and then serve elsewhere so that it's not specific certain gatekeepers who are controlling that, that uh, we also look for people to serve as reviewers who are not on our editorial board if you have competencies and skills in certain areas. So we always appreciate that. And of course, the subscription. So that's a little bit about us. I also should mention that we have intentionally edited and worked with our reviewer evaluation form to more accurately reflect the process, our review process. And we've done that with the entire editorial team, uh, the whole board. And we meet as a group once a, a semester, at least, if not more than that, and ask for their feedback and implement things that the field feels like we should for the journal. So now I'll turn it back over to Tom for right. a little bit more specifics. Yeah, I'm going to walk us through the process. So if, you've, if you're uh, someone who is uh, um, thinking about submitting uh, to our journal or another one, um, often what happens after you submit your paper uh, is unknown to authors. And we wanted to make that very transparent um, to people. So uh, for RHE, you go into the uh, Scholar One manuscript submission system. Um, and that's where you submit your manuscript. There's a small process that you go through, fill out some things and upload your document. Um, when that happens, uh, we get pinged that there's a new, <laughs> there's a new submission and um, the managing editors go in and do a check, an initial check. Uh, and we try to do that as quickly as possible um, in the you know, day or two after it's been received. Uh, so folks know if you, know, you submitted a manuscript to us um, that was about, um, you know, fixing the engine of a Nissan uh, automobile. We're going to look at that manuscript and say, it's not appropriate for our journal. Um, and we'll send it back and say, you might want to send it somewhere else. It's not appropriate. Um, someone asked, how, you know, how many, how many uh, 
manuscripts are submitted. We're receiving over 350 manuscripts uh, a year at this point, and we're only publishing 20 to 24 a year, which makes our acceptance rate pretty low. Um, and so we're rejecting a lot of really good work, actually. So, um, so that so we are also helping people understand where where they might submit their other work. Um, so in the you, field, I'm sorry, Tom. I, I also ahead. want to mention that the the field and the publications committee is very aware of this with Ash, and they're in conversation about what does this mean for the field to not have this be the only publication for the for the association. So. Yes. Thank you for the question. Um, so if you're submitting to us, you're going to see this process. And you, what, what you should know is you're going to get good feedback. It is the chances that you get are going to get in are fairly low, um, especially from that initial submission. Um, but uh, it's going to get looked at uh, by the managing editors. The editors are going to look at it um, in a few days, and they'll assign it to an associate editor. The editors also play the associate editor role. So um, sometimes we assign manuscripts to ourselves. Um, the associate editor then has a few days to um, pick and invite reviewers, hopefully get them to agree. If you're a reviewer for RHE, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. If you are a reviewer for another journal, thank you very much because it's a, it's a critical role uh, for the field. They, we, the, our reviewers are the people who help make the scholarship that's out there better. Um, and, and so it, reviewers elevate um, uh, the quality of the scholarship in the field, and we really appreciate that. So reviewers get it, they get about, they get 30 days uh, to turn around their review. Sometimes we have to poke people a little bit uh, to get their reviews in. Um, so that can uh, sometimes take a, a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit less than 30 days, uh, if people are particularly on top of it. Um, at that stage, when the reviews come back, the associate editors and editors write a letter that summarizes some of the feedback and gives people a sense of what's uh, what what was um, good and um, some things that need to be worked on in the manuscript potentially, and they um, provide a decision. Um, and so that decision can be. Uh, on the first submission, it would be extremely rare for someone to get an accept. So most of the options are you get rejected or um, you get a revise and resubmit. Uh, and if you get a revise and resubmit, you then have 90 days to address the feedback that's been given and, um, and then send it back. And when, when you send it back, it goes through this same process again. And it keeps going through this process until you receive an accept or a reject. Um, and once you're in the revise and resubmit um, area, it is more likely that you're going to get an accept uh, than otherwise. Um, but there are times when we will reject manuscripts after they've been revised because uh, the revision did not adequately address the feedback given by the reviewers. Um, now, once a manuscript is accepted, I know I as an author and I know other authors out there at that point, what we want is for our scholarship to be seen as quickly as possible. And this is a part of the process that a lot of people don't have a, a good understanding of unless you've been on an editorial team. Um, but we sell, tell someone that they're accepted conditionally upon doing some cleanup stuff and authors get a couple of weeks to do that cleanup stuff two to four weeks. And um, then they submit that final manuscript, final should be in quotes there, because it's going to get um, worked on a little bit um, through this process. But then it, it goes to the managing editors who do a review um, and the editors. It gets submitted to um, a copy editor to make sure that the cop that, you know, words are spelled correctly, APA is done well, um, there aren't funny things uh, in the manuscript. Uh, that copy edited version comes back after, at, in a, uh, three weeks or less. It then uh, gets approved by the editorial team and moved to the publisher. And then uh, it goes through proof production. Um, what it's, the proofs are what it's going to look like in the, in, in the actual journal. Um, and 
Then it gets sent to the authors. <laughs> they get to see if the changes the copy editor uh, or the publisher made make sense and confirm that everything's okay. And then a final proof is produced. We're working on having DOIs assigned soon after that process so that um, we can post online manuscripts before they make it into an issue. Um, but this process takes 10 to 14 weeks. We're talking about, you know, three months worth of time in general between someone getting accepted and us having these, uh, the final looking or almost final looking um, manuscript produced. So it takes, takes some time. And that's something that's important to understand. Then from those things that have been turned into proofs that are not going to be changed, we identify a group of four or five manuscripts that we're going to put into an issue. The issue has the, the proof has to be, the issue needs to be proofed. So a full issue needs to, uh, we need to get a proof of that uh, with table of contents and everything else. Um, that takes a couple weeks. We review that issue um, and then send it back and it takes about two weeks to print it. So the time from us having manu accepted manuscripts that are in their full proof form to a printed issue takes about five weeks. And I think, well, I, I can say a little bit uh, here, I, um, and Penny, you can jump in and, and talk about this. I wanted to emphasize the fact that, um, you know, RHE, if people have said this in their comments, and we've been talking about this, but we need people, and we're all basically volunteers. Um, and um, so we need our community. Someone asked, are the timelines I just talked about typical for the major journals? And I would say yes. Um, we're trying to be as quick <laughs> as possible. Some journals are a little bit uh, more comfortable with longer time frames. Uh, so, um, so there are some journals that, that take a little bit longer. But most of the major higher ed journals are somewhere in the range that, we're, that I just showed. Um, but there are groups of people, the editorial team who you've met in this session, um, that put a lot of time and effort into making the journal work. The editorial board, which is our primary group of um, reviewers, uh, and there's generally an editorial board member reviewing every, um, every issue. Uh, and, um, and then our authors and reviewers. Without our authors and reviewers, this just would not would not happen. And in our context, no one's, you know, there's not a lot of money here involved. This is, we're doing this because it's important to the field and we believe in the process. Um, and for our reviewers, uh, as you've heard people talk about, strong reviews really matter. They're what mo moves things uh, in from good to great, uh, if you want to use that idea. Um, and um, I just, can't say enough about our reviewers and um, and the feedback we've gotten. Penny, do you want to say anything here? Sure. Uh, I, I know that it's so th thoughtful of people, even when they receive a reject letter. Thank you so much. This was really a, a thoughtful reject letter. I know it's not the letter I wanted, but it helped me to get published here or there. And we take great pride in that, that it, we approach it with a sense of humanity. It's always hard to get that kind of letter. And so appreciate that. Someone had mentioned about that pipeline. How do you get in there? Because that's what we, the process there is that we put out and we'll, Victoria will talk about Twitter in a minute, but we put out a call every once in a while and say, please let us know if you're interested in reviewing because we do use a lot of reviewers who are not on the editorial board just to get your perspective as well as if people are doing a couple reviews and not on our board, we pay attention to those numbers and those solid, thoughtful reviews. And then that's the group that we turn to the next year or the year after to invite them to serve on the editorial board. And uh, once you've served on the editorial board, hopefully you would be interested in an associate editor position at some point. That's what Tom and I did. We were associate editors. That I then served as a senior associate editor for the Journal of Higher Education, where I worked with Tom uh, and uh, Scott Thomas. And then Tom and I here now are editors. So it's that pipeline process. And we 
we do want uh, great reviewers. So you can always shoot us an email. Uh, Jess or Victoria will put our email in the chat. So you can send us an email, please let us know. We can put you on our reviewer list as well as you can always go into the Scholar One system and they'll put that link up there. We go through Scholar One and we use with Project Muse with Johns Hopkins University Press and they have a database of anyone who would be a reviewer, not just for our journal, but for other journals as well and so often we'll search in that system so those are different ways to get in that pipeline someone also asked about diversity which is extremely important to us and so we have conversations about what that means regarding uh, content area race gender uh, uh, Qual, quant, mixed methods, historical, you'll hear from Eddie in a little bit. We've really been intentional about increasing the historical work. And so uh, this is a part of the conversation always as we move forward. And I, I think it's worth mentioning that this is a value and something that um, is part of the strategic priorities of ASH. And so it's not, it's not just something we say, it's something that we do, but also because we're the journal of ASH, ASH Publications Committee and the ASH Board um, work with us. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fairly collaborative, but they want the journal to be um, diverse. They want the editorial board to be a representation of the ASH community. Um, and they want, and, and we want, Penny and I want also the editorial board to be, to not just look like ASH does now, but maybe what ASH should look like in five or 10 years. And so we have an eye towards those things. Um, so thank you for that, that question. Um, I think- um, Someone the, did ask, go ahead. Yeah, well, it was about the open peer review model. I saw a question about that. Okay. Um, and uh, we haven't had uh, uh, extensive conversations about that, but, um, but we, um, uh, I, I don't, right now, I'm not sure it's a fit for what we're trying to accomplish, but, um, but you know, it's something that we can talk about as a team. Um, so, all right, we can, I think this is where other people are going to pick up. Penny, did you want to talk about the reviewer evaluations? I certainly can. I had that okay. on the list that I already, um, oh. yeah, I, Sorry, I was following the facilitator guide, which didn't oh, ha sorry. have this. I'm sorry, I'm happy to talk about it. So what we did is because Tom and I came in about a year and a half ago, we just were operating with reviewer evaluations that looked a little bit different than the values that we've just been talking about and the goals of uh, the journal. It also with uh, only what, 20 to 25 slots per year, it really means that reviewers have to think about, is this worth one of those slots? How do we actually review in a way that's thoughtful and as intentional as we would like it to be? And uh, so we worked with the entire editorial board to make sure that we uh, worked on the reviewer evaluation. So if you're a reviewer for us, you'll notice that change. There's a just a little bit more that you're sharing with us and with the uh, author and hopefully that feedback, if it's accepted or a revised or resubmit, it really help, will help the author there. Uh, I think it's Jess, Jess that's gonna yeah. talk about COVID. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, so in March, obviously our worlds were kind of upended um, in unexpected ways. And so as we began to learn about how COVID was going to change our world, um, our team met to discuss how we should respond, um, recognizing that we needed to care for ourselves, we needed to care for one another, we needed to care for our families, but then all of the different demands that COVID brought into our world for um, our editorial board, for our reviewers, um, and even for our readers and authors. And so um, after a lot of conversation, we ended up deciding um, to keep the journal operating. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we, in doing so, we were caring for the people who still were looking at uh, promotion and tenure clocks that hadn't changed, even though the world was changing. Um, and also just acknowledging that like our lives became kind of crazy for a little while. And we're still dealing with those things now. Um, but as such, we adopted a, a new timeline um, for our authors and for our reviewers. And we automatically granted two week extensions. Um, to both the author and reviewer deadlines 
that allowed for additional flexibility for us to be able to say, hey, like, I got to take care of kids now, or hey, like, I need a little extra time um, for these things. And so um, one of the other things that we did as well is we invited um, new volunteers uh, to serve in an ad hoc capacity. And so these were just some of the ways that we responded. Um, in July, we reverted those changes since life got back to normal, but we still um, approach all of our journal operations with making sure that we're caring for people and humanizing people because academia can kind of dehumanize people and there can be so many different demands that we're facing um, that don't always take into account the craziness of our lives. And so um, as a team, that's just something that we really care about um, and we decided to do. Thanks, Jess. Victoria, are you gonna talk about the Twitter? Yeah, just a couple words. Um, so like many other journals, RUT is interested in responding to current events. However, the publication process often makes this difficult to respond in a timely fashion. So we decided that we were going to utilize social media to promote and distribute information to educate the public and encourage discussion. So for instance, in early June, we made the decision that um, we would post materials um, both in and outside of our journal to address anti-Blackness, racism, and activism in support of the Black Lives Matter movement um, on our Twitter page. So when DACA came out and it went before the U.S. Supreme Court, we also shared relevant RHE articles, um, and we plan to continue to do this as important issues um, come into higher ed and hit the news cycle. So that's part of my job. So I'm going to share our Twitter handler. And if you ever have suggestions like, hey, this is going on in the world and we think it's important, we're more than open to having those suggestions. Feel free to email us and I'll also include our email as well. And, and just to let folks know, I mean, so this is how RHE responded to a lot of the things that were happening this year, both normal things like understanding our review process and the absolutely um, abnormal, well, some normal and tragic things like um, violence against uh, our black community members, um, but also the COVID-19, which is new and novel. Um, and uh, but different journals respond in, it responded in other ways. And so it's something to pay attention to. Some, some did nothing. They just continued with, with the way that they um, operate. And others shut down for a while. Others uh, um, took, took different approaches. So this is, this is the approach that we took. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Eddie Cole to talk a little bit about book reviews. Hey, hello everyone. Again, uh, thanks for joining us um, today to uh, talk more about RIT. And I, I just want to give you a brief, I mean, very brief overview of book reviews for RIT and some of the things we're looking for. So I'll hit these bullet points and starting off with what is a book review? And I like to describe it to potential reviewers as, you know, a serious yet succinct piece of academic writing because they are roughly about 2,000 words in length. So it's not long, but uh, we expect them to cover a lot of ground. Um, and so really, you know, just thinking about uh, a book review, not as a summary, but as a really analytical piece about what the particular book you're reviewing, what it contributes to the field, um, you know, how does it push us to think differently or does it sort of repeat things that we already know? Uh, really just sort of situate the book within the overall body of literature on that particular topic covered in the book. Now, with that said, um, I want to put the next two uh, bullet points together. I'll discuss sort of how book reviews are selected and what types of books make good reviews. So the first thing uh, we look at is the timeliness of the book. Uh, when was it published? So in this particular case, uh, we're very intentional in trying to have reviews published on books that are fairly recently published uh, within the last I, you know, I would love to receive a review within a year of when the book was published. Uh, so if you're like me, you know, just being frank, uh, you may buy a book right away, but you might not get a chance to actually read that book until a few months later. Uh, so in that case, I might receive a review of a book that was published two, three years ago when someone has finally got around to reading it. That's not the, uh, that's one thing that we would use right away to say, thanks, but no thanks, you know, sort of missed a window of keeping it fresh, if you will. The next thing uh, we look for is it, a book being based on original research, right? So uh, in the sense that uh, we're not looking to have reviews published around sort of these professional guidance books. 
um, you know, one that's sort of directly geared toward practitioners based on someone's professional expertise, right? Their experience working. Uh, we're not looking for those, uh, even though they're, even though those have a great value to the field and so forth. We're really interested in these sort of longer books uh, based on research, these extensive studies. And so what I like to uh, tell, again, potential reviewers is if this book that's in front of you were an article on the same topic, would it be of interest to RHA readership? And that's been really helpful for people to think about what books they choose and not choose uh, to submit to us. And then finally, um, what does RHA, what does RHA look for in a book review? Uh, one, it really is a unique perspective, right? I, I consider the reviewer uh, as much as I consider the book itself. Uh, so one recent uh, book review that was just uh, accepted uh, is, you know, it's a it's book based on, uh, you know, tenure track faculty and the likelihood and the status of, you know, finding faculty positions within higher education at large, not just within the field of higher education, but in general. But the review was written by an adjunct professor. And I thought that was a pretty particular uh, unique uh, perspective to have a reviewer engage that particular topic whose role is primarily as an adjunct professor, right? So I look at the uniqueness of the reviewer, their perspective. Um, I also uh, try to emphasize having someone who is a faculty member and established researcher, and we encourage those people to co-author their reviews with graduate students if interested, um, if need be. And so that's just uh, some of the brief things. And then finally, I just want to emphasize that um, if you look at the historical trajectory of the book reviews in RHE, you may notice uh, two, three years ago, an issue had four or five book reviews per issue. And now we've uh, narrowed that down to be much more focused to only having one or two book reviews per issue. But the same idea, the same value for the book review is still there. We still want to emphasize it and elevate it in, in importance, in its importance, uh, mainly for thinking about the authors as well, right? So if you write a book and you would love to have it reviewed in RHE, we want to make sure that we get a good thorough review of your work um, in a leading journal in the field. So hopefully that gives a little bit of overview for uh, the book reviews. But at any point, seriously, uh, check out the book review guidelines online and feel free to reach out and ask me any questions about book reviews. Thanks. Thank you, Eddie. And now some tips for submitting from Associate Editor Heather Rowan Kenyon. Hello, everyone. Um, and knowing not being able to see folks and and do a show of hands of where folks are, I'm sort of thinking about. I'm assuming there are a number of graduate students or um, new professors or recent graduates who are part of the group to think about. Okay, what are some tips as you're thinking about submitting to us for the first time? And I know particularly sometimes you have a dissertation that you're finishing or trying to think want to be able to publish from your dissertation i think this is a great time to have a conversation with your dissertation chair or a mentor in the field or peers that have come before you to think about how can you um, split up your dissertation in a way that is uh, manuscript length because a lot of times your dissertation is multiple hundreds of pages and so how do you then bring that down into 30 pages because the page limit is something that we take seriously because that impacts the number of other articles that we are able to publish in a year so read the guidelines is one of the first things if you think the review of higher ed is the place for you um, a couple things read the guidelines and make sure you're familiar with those because usually that's that first stop with Victoria that comes in is most likely to come back to you saying you're not abiding by the format. So that's one thing to think about. The second is make sure we're the right fit content wise. That do you see articles similar to content areas that you're interested in to see if this is the right fit. It might be a different journal that's a good fit. One of the ways if you're not really sure what's the good fit, particularly if you're breaking down a dissertation, is to read through your reference page um, section of your dissertation and think, wow, which journal am I seeing pop up multiple times? That might be a signal that that journal or that type of journal is a good fit for you. Um, the second is read the articles in the review because they're good models of things that are accepted. 
as Tom and Penny had already talked about, it's a small number that are accepted. So the more that you can um, follow those models of excellence that you see that are published in thinking about format, um, style, order of sections can be helpful for you in the process. Next, I would say get feedback from mentors and peers uh, before you submit the first time. We find that work that others have reviewed and given you feedback, whether you're in a writing group of peers or can connect with someone else to be able to read it, can give you good feedback to strengthen your manuscript before you bring it in. If you're an early graduate student, if you're in your first or second year, and thinking about wanting to participate in the publishing process, and what I'm gonna say I realize is impossible for everyone depending on the institution, but to work on a research team, either with a faculty member or um, a group of other students for your early publishing opportunities, I find is helpful to be able to learn and have mentors in the process. So if you're an early graduate student, I would say um, to look out for some of those opportunities along, along the way. One of the other pieces is what is a new contribution is one of the things that we ask for. We ask reviewers, um, do you think that this manuscript, when you review it, is going to make a significant impact on the field? Is this a model for future work in the field? Does this extend our current thinking? And now the extension of current thinking can come from, it could be new methods that you're applying. You could be looking at something in a new context. You could have new frameworks or new language that you're using in these areas. So is it something new and different? We have many beautifully written pieces that we think we've seen something like that before, so might not be a good fit for the journal. What are the ways that you are pushing your work um, in that way? The other thing is that we are an applied field of higher ed. So to definitely be able to make that connection in the discussion, in the conclusions, and in the implications that, um, that are important to think how can this work be utilized in um, particular ways. I think sometimes authors run out of space often when they get to that point um, because they're trying to fit so many things in, but to not forget that is one of the really important pieces. Um, and I'm going to stop there. All right. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, and we're going to move to tips for reviewers from Leslie Gonz Associate Editor Leslie Gonzalez. Hi everyone, so um, I have a few tips for reviewers and particularly I'm, I'm first going to address folks that are wanting to get involved in the review process and kind of curious, Penny already referenced this earlier, but kind of curious about how to get involved. So um, as, as Tom mentioned earlier also, we, we our, our first go-to for reviewers tend to be our editorial board, that's their primary you know mission, that's their charge, but we're always looking for additional reviewers who can bring in ideological, methodological, theoretical diversity, um, and something new. And so sometimes what will happen is we will, you know, we scan Google Scholar, we talk with one another, we reach out to our networks, and we ask, who do you know who's doing work on X topic? And what that means is that you might end up with this surprise invitation to review for the review of higher education. Um, and this is somewhat, this is a role that is described as an ad hoc reviewer. It means that you're not necessarily on the editorial board yet, but we would love to have your contribution. We would love to have your expertise um, on this particular paper. Um, I always encourage folks to take up that opportunity. Um, largely, this reflects, you know, my perspective on reviewing. I think that reviewing is, it's a great service, and it's also a really great opportunity to learn what's happening out in the field, how people are writing about topics, how people are using new methodologies, using theory in, in new ways. And so one of the best ways to get involved in the review of higher ed or any other journal is to say yes to those surprise ad hoc invitations. Um, additionally, as um, Victoria noted for you in the chat box, you can always reach out to us and, and we can guide you through signing up to be an ad hoc or volunteer reviewer. So there's a way for you to signal to us, hey, I'm out here. I have this kind of expertise. I'd love to get involved in the review process. And to be honest, that's how I became in, involved in the review process years and years ago, it seems like. 
If you are new to the review process, um, I want to share a few tips with you about what we're looking for in high quality reviews. We look for reviews to contain constructive, even if critical, but constructive advice for paper writers. Um, we take really seriously our responsibility to do no harm in the review process. And what that means is if we get a review in and it contains some language that is, you know, just not necessary, um, destructive, harmful, we will make sure to attend to that and, and revise that. That is not something that we want to promote or to see affiliated with the review of higher ed. However, we want to see thoughtful comments. We want to see constructive advice that addresses um, the content, the methodology, the fundamental conceptualization of the paper. Um, we want to understand how the reviewer um, is helping the author think through the logic of their argument, um, the congruence of the paper. It's helpful and great to have reviewers give, um, you know, grammatical and, and editorial advice, but we're really looking for that content, subject matter, theoretical level of analysis in your reviews. So we want to see some fleshed out reviews, nothing too short, you know, sometimes we get a review and it's about a paragraph that doesn't give us enough to work with and it's not the kind of feedback we want to provide back to authors who have worked so hard on, on their documents. Um, also, I'll just flag this. If we get a review that is really short or doesn't really address the heart of, of, the, of the paper, that really sort of clogs up our timeline. What that means is that we then have to go back out into our pool of reviewers, try to find somebody else to, find, to provide an additional review. And that just slows up the process for, for everyone. Um, those are just a few tips um, and insider uh, knowledge that I have about reviews. And if you haven't reviewed for us yet and you get one of those surprise invitations, just know it's because we think you're excellent and we would love to have you support the process. Thank you. All right. Um, here's some information about RHE, how you can uh, access information about um, the journal. And I, I just I want to thank everybody who was participating in the presentation today and thank, um, thank everybody that's in the session. Your questions have been great and we really appreciate um, uh, the work that you're doing uh, and hope that you do consider submitting work to RHE. Um, and we're going to move into breakout rooms in a moment here. Uh, and I think Penny's going to assign us. So when you get invited to a breakout room, please accept <laughs> um, and go there and we can have more of a personal exchange at that point. Um, and we're going to break up the editors and associate and managing editors into rooms and uh, you're randomly assigned and we'll hit go right now so we can answer your questions until a quarter after the hour. So thank you again for all your volunteering and work in the field. We just appreciate you so much. So we'll see you in the breakout rooms.